This is going to be different, learning to live with Chinese power. Our speaker, that's the title. Our speaker, Professor Hugh White, AO, FASSA, Professor Emeritus of Strategic Studies at the Australian National University, is going to address him. Who is Hugh White? Hugh spent much of his career in the Australian government. He was an international relations advisor to Prime Minister Bob Hawke and Deputy Secretary for Strategy in the Department of Defense. That's quite a young man. He was the founding director of Australian Strategic Policy Institute. And from 2004 to 2011, he was head of the ANU Strategic and Defense Studies Center. He has many publications, including Power Shift, Australia's Future Between Washington and Beijing, 2010, The China Choice, Why America Should Share Power, 2012, Without America, Australia's Future in the New Asia, 2017, and How to Defend Australia, 2019. I think we get a glimpse from those book titles and previous positions of what some of the interesting points, challenges, and controversies are going to be. All of it tempered by Hugh's study in the 1970s of philosophy at the universities of Melbourne and Oxford. But from the idea that China uh, is rising, and that this is shifting relationships among the countries of the world and challenging us about our attitudes to China as well as to other countries. Uh, Hugh is suggesting that there will be changes in the relationships between America and China and that denial by Americans of their proper role in the world is causing great difficulties. So how does Australia make its way in an Asia no longer dominated by our great and powerful friends? Hugh suggests that how we answer that question will do much to define us as a nation. Since that was written a couple of months ago, maybe there's a new sentence or two. How has Putin changed the calculus? And how has the recent Australian election changed that calculus? And I'm just giving a warning but because there's question time coming up. And if that's not addressed, I'll have my hand up first. But I see you nodding in agreement, so we're safe. There will be a Q&A to add spice if any is needed. And it's going to be led by Emeritus Professor Christina Slade, an old i.e. long-standing interlocutor of Hugh White from their Oxford days. Christina is the chair of the Society's Program Committee, which has brought us this event this evening. Have your questions ready for the Q&A. And here comes Hugh White to address us now. Thank you very much, Hugh. It's all yours. Well, thank you very much. Judith, thanks Christy for the invitation. Thanks everyone for coming, particularly on this not terribly clement weather. I come from Canberra where we're used to using the weather as an excuse not to go out, but it's a little bit more unusual here in, here in Sydney. What a remarkable thing that this society has been going for 200 years. I had to look twice when Christy sent me the notice and it said the 1,034th OGM. I thought, that can't be right. Well, maybe it could be. It's a remarkable achievement, and it seems fitting somehow that we meet in this building, which is in its own way also a great sort of symbol of the thirst with which the people who, after European settlement, sought to shape the society that uh, has evolved on this continent. Their attempts to frame the kind of society we were going to become in very positive ways. And what I'm going to talk about this evening is what seems to me to be a very significant next step in that process. How do we work out the kind of society we are on this continent, in this part of the world, 
uh, with the circumstances that surround us. And I'm going to try and talk dispassionately about some issues that arise, arouse a fair amount of passions. Um, so I hope that works. Well, I say dispassionately. Actually, there's some aspects of it about which I'm pretty passionate, and you'll discover that as we go along. So my starting point is a very simple observation, is that obviously something big is happening. We've just been through an election which was more car key, that is by which I mean that questions of national security, strategy, foreign policy, defence policy weighed more heavily, featured more prominently in the election campaign than I think from my slightly inexpert study than any election campaign since the great Vietnam election campaign of 1966. And, uh, and there's, there's a reason for that. Or you might say two reasons for that. The first is that our relations with China over the last three years, really since March, April, um, well, in some ways five years since 2017, it accentuated, uh, I think, very sh sharply in early 2020. Our relations with China have become as bad as our relations have, have ever been with a great power uh, since 1945. Um, uh, and certainly as bad as we've seen with a great power that is as important as China is today to us on so many dimensions of our national life. It's our biggest trading partner still, but it's also a major source of immigrants and it is the most powerful country in our region. And so the fact that our relationship with China has, has dived as spectacularly as it, as it has is itself very significant a very significant thing. But what makes it much more significant is that it's very clear that this is part of something much bigger. Um, much bigger both, so to speak, chronologically and geographically. Bigger chronologically in the sense that as our political leaders on both sides of politics seek to explain to us what's going on, they reach back to the 1930s. They reach back to the, to the moments before, you could say, the most cataclysmic strategic crisis the world has ever seen, with a clear implication that the things we're seeing happening today potentially foreshadow a cataclysm of comparable scale. And I think they might be right. I'll come back to that. Um, but, but, it's, but it's also... Um, bigger than, than just our problems with China, not just chronologically, but geographically. Last week, uh, our Prime Minister, newly hatched from the electoral egg, emerged sort of blinking and a bit bewildered, it seemed to me, in Madrid at a, meto, at a meeting of NATO, an, un, uh, an unprecedentedly large meeting of NATO, NATO supplemented by other countries, four countries and from the Asia Pacific, including ourselves in which NATO I, I, I did something quite significant. It declared that China didn't call it a threat, but it did call it a challenge to, to NATO, including to NATO's security. Um, and so we're, and we're seeing there the emergence of a consciousness that what we're seeing here in Australia in relation to China is seen in similar terms in Europe. And of course, what sits on top of that is Ukraine and the way in which the, the crisis in Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Ukraine in the last, uh, since February, has added to, amplified, exacerbated all of the anxieties that we have in our part of the world about what's going on. And what I want to do is to explore this, unpack it, offer an explanation for what's going on and talk about how we work through this and what comes out the other side. Well, what is it? Something big is happening, but what is it that's happening? Well, I think the best way to understand that is, is, to, is to see it as a, as a challenge to the global order. And by global order, I, I don't mean anything very grand. I, I just mean the set of assumptions and expectations and, and rules, sometimes informal rules, which, which frame the way in which countries get on with one another. And it's a pretty hard thing to define in more precise terms, but it's a very real thing. 
countries, international relations don't just happen in a vacuum. They happen within a set of expectations, actually like all human relationships. And by order, I just mean that set of expectations uh, and assumptions which frame the way in which states get on with one another. And one of the most dramatic developments in our respective lifetimes was the, was the collapse of the bipolar order of the Cold War that had emerged in the late 1940s with, the, with a structural rivalry between the US and the Soviet Union, which framed international relations around the world, and its replacement with a US-led unipolar order after the collapse of the Soviet Union. This was, at least for us, and when I say us, I don't just mean Australia, but for the West at large, a very happy moment. We believed that we'd moved into a new global order based on the values and, and ideals and, and ideas which had characterised our societies. Uh, it appeared to be very broadly supported, supported by America's friends and allies in Europe, in NATO and across Europe as NATO enlarged, in Japan, arguably in India, I'll come back to that, the whole gamut of what we call the West. But there was also a very strong expectation it was going to spread beyond that, that, that a, a, a unipolar global order in which the United States was the sole global power and exercised decisive strategic influence everywhere would promote the emergence of, of liberal democratic political systems and market economic systems around the world. This was what Francis Fukuyama meant when he talked about the end of history, all of the debates about how to organise society and how to relate society to economics and so on appeared to be resolved by the emergence of this unipolar US-led order, in which, which promised, amongst other things, not just the support for the values that we collectively as societies had, had developed through and had promoted and believed in, but it also promised an era of peace because without the contestation that we'd seen, particularly in the 20th century, the First World War, the Second World War, the Cold War, there seemed no reason not to hope that all the world's major powers, accepting the same basic ideas about the organisation, both of their own societies and of, and of the international community, would find no particular reason to compete with one another, let alone go to war with one another. And Right at the basis of that was the confidence that both the, world, the global powers around the world, major powers around the world would accept, and not just accept, but welcome and embrace that idea, but that if anybody didn't, they'd have America to, to answer to, and that America's power was going to be so preponderant that even a great powers like China and Russia, who attempted to push against it, would decide against it. It just no one was going to dare to take the United States on. It is important to remember that through the 1990s, from about the middle of the 1990s on, people seriously started describing America as the new Rome, as a country with unparalleled global preponderance in every dimension of national power, which was confidently expected to last throughout the 21st century. Um, and as I say, this was a vision which I at least found extremely congenial. It's not that I love everything about America. I don't. But I prefer to have a US-led global order than many of the alternatives. And that's what we're going to come back to. Now, the story we're facing at the moment, what we see when we uh, encounter our difficulties with China, what NATO was talking about in Madrid, what we're seeing in the steps of uh, eastern Ukraine right now, and what we fear and sense in Asia, East Asia today, is the fact that in one really crucial uh, respect, that vision of global orders just turned out to be wrong. US power is not unchallenged. The unipolar order is not unchallenged. It is being challenged right now, by China and Russia. And how we, how we address that challenge, how we approach it, how we deal with it, 
is the great question of uh, international affairs today. Now, I think it's worth making the point that, that those are not the only challenges that that vision of US-led global order face. It does face challenges from within the United States itself, and I think not just from Trump, but I think more broadly. And it also faces challenges elsewhere. It faces challenges in Britain. I think Brexit was, amongst other things, a rejection of some of the ideas and expectations and assumptions that underpinned that 1990s vision of order. Um, some of what we saw in the recent French elections, I would say the same, and, and so on. I could spend a bit of time elaborating that thought. But the challenges that fr from within the West, if I can put it that way, use that imprecise but important term, uh, I think pale into insignificance compared to the challenges that are coming from these two powerful states outside the West. Now, I think the best way to start thinking about how we address this challenge is to ask, well, what's the alternative we're looking at? If these guys don't like the US-led unipolar order that appeared to emerge at the end of the Cold War, what do they want instead? And there are two ways of thinking about that, two possibilities. The first is that what they want to do is to replace the US-led unipolar order with a unipolar order of their own that they lead. And an order which is based not on the principles of liberal democracy and market economics, but of autocracy and some version of managed market economics of the sort that we see in very different ways in Russia and China today. This, uh, this, is, a, this is a very powerful idea. It's the preponderant idea. It's the idea that Scott Morrison, when he was prime minister, referred to with the phrase arc of autocracy. Uh, it's the idea that uh, that uh, Joe Biden referred to, referred to when he spoke in his first State of the Union address about America and China and Russia being in a contest for the 21st century. Um, it's the idea that was embedded in the NATO summit last week when NATO committed itself not just to resisting what Russia was doing in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, but what China is doing in East Asia. And they, and they spoke of uh, in their statement that, that ch China challenging not just NATO's security, but also its values and political philosophy. Um, and uh, the, th the thought that underpins that is that a, just as a US-led unipolar order based on democracy and, and liberal ep economics would have spread those values and those ideas around the world, we fear that uh, uh, an arc of aut autocracy, an autocratic-led unipolar order, would spread their ideas around the world and would threaten the way we organise our society and the way societies throughout the West will be organised. And that, that, that set of that, that, that sort of that, that set of fears and anxieties have become very much part of the conversation in Australia, in the United States, in Europe, and elsewhere. Without people, I think, really pausing to think about it very carefully. And the reason I think it's worth thinking about it very carefully is because that's not the only alternative. There's another way in which the international order could evolve um, uh, in response to the challenge that's been posed by Russia and China. And that is that we move not to a, from a US-led unipolar order to a China-Russia-led unipolar order, but that we end up somewhere halfway, halfway in between with a multipolar order. Now, I could spend a bit of time unpacking that idea, but I just want to sketch it to you. The alternative is that we end up with a, with a world in which no single power or group of powers predominates, no single ide ideology or set of ideas predominates. We have a, there is a, in, instead, we have a collection of great powers, uh, each of them dominant in their own region or sub-region. Uh, straight off the top of one's head, one would imagine that the United States would be one, China would be one, India would be another, Russia, I think still, interesting question, but I think Russia would definitely be one, uh, and Europe, in some strange way, however Europe evolves as a strategic actor, would be one, and there might well be others as well. Each of those regional great powers would seek a sphere of influence, as great powers have always done. Um, uh, they would certainly they would seek to to 
to achieve predominant influence over the countries in their immediate uh, neighbourhood. Um, uh, how, how, how intrusive that uh, their, their, their predominant influence would be would be an interesting question and might vary from one region to another. But between them, there'd be quite a lot of political diversity. Uh, some of those great powers would be uh, authoritarian or autocratic. Some of them would be democratic. Some of them would be a mix of, of different, um, uh, different elements. And between them, there'd be a fairly constant pattern of contestation and rivalry. Now, that, what I've drawn on to sketch that potential for a different alternative to the existing order is, of course, a very classic pattern of the way in which multipolar orders, which are very common in history, have existed in the past. And the best laboratory for these is Europe, uh, continental Europe, through uh, most of them, almost all of the modern era, uh, which has in, embodied a, a precisely that kind of multipolar, multi-great power uh, strategic order. And much depend, how, and how that ends up depends a lot on how the contestation and rivalry between them is managed. At the moment, the overwhelming view in Australia, I think, and elsewhere in the West is that we're not heading for, for a new multipolar order of the sort I've just sketched. We're heading for a, a new unipolar order, the arc of autocracy model. And uh, that's a proposition I want to contest, but I'm going to come back to it in a little while. Because first I want to talk about our response. Not surprisingly, considering that, we, that, that the judgment has been reached as I say, without, I think, very much analysis, that the alternative to the unipolar order that we know and love, uh, headed by the United States, is a unipolar order that we'd find very, very disconcerting indeed. Our response has been, and I mean by our, I mean Australia's, but also the West's more broadly, has been uh, what you might call aggressively defensive. That is, we've, there's been an instant view that... Um, that the only response that's possible is to push back as hard as we can and to preserve the US-led order uh, with all the vigour at our command. And there's, I think, two elements to that. One, one is an element which I think is entirely understandable at one level at least, and, and that is that the view that the ideals upon which the US-led order is based are simply better morally better, you might also say practically better, although there's a, one could have a discussion about that, but certainly morally better. And I think that's part of what motivates us when, we, when our instant response to this challenge is just to hit back really hard. And the sense that it's morally better has certainly been reinforced by the conduct of Russia in the Ukraine. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about Russia and the Ukraine in my remarks here, but I'm very happy to explore it more broadly in questions. It's a very interesting, I mean, very important, but also a very interesting crisis. But I will just make the point that the sense that there's a clear moral difference between um, our side and theirs, if I can put it that way, has always been there. It's been strengthened by the authoritarian turn in China particularly over the last decade or so. And you know, one could think of, of Hong Kong and, and um, Xinjiang and many other things as well. But it's been even further amplified by the way in which Russia has conducted itself in Ukraine. But I would just make this point. The distinction between Russia trying to assert a sphere of influence over Ukraine, which one might not like, but which is, put it this way, it's not that unusual. Russia, after all, America, after all, asserts a sphere of influence over the whole of the Western Hemisphere and we claim a sphere of influence over the Southwest Pacific. What's objectionable to, to me about what Russia's done is not the fact that it's asserting a sphere of influence, it's that it's doing it, first of all, by invading other countries, and there's a lot of ways of asserting a sphere of influence other than by invasion. And secondly, that invasion has been conducted so brutally. Uh, and both of those, I think, have had a very significant effect on our approach, the way we think about um, uh, uh, the, the response to the the challenge that the post-Cold War order faces. But I think it, we also have to look into our hearts and recognise that another thing that drives the spontaneously 
as I say, aggressively defensive response to the Chinese and Russian challenge, is the sense that we want to defend what's ours. We deserve to have a global order based on our ideals because we won the First World War and we won the Second World War and we won the Cold War. And that's how we built this order and we want to hang on to it. And I don't decry that, I can understand that. Um, but what that drives is a very emotional um, pushback uh, and a determination to preserve the old US-led order uh, intact at almost any cost. And I, and I don't doubt, let me be clear again, I don't doubt for a moment that that would be the best outcome. If I got a vote, I'd vote for a unipolar order based on US primacy any day of the week. Um, but I think the, 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 um, the emotion, the sort of visceralness of this response is particularly important and particularly strong in Australia. Because for Australia, there's something slightly more at stake than for everybody else. And the reason for that is that when we see, a ch when we see China's challenge to the US-led order as it exists in Asia, you can say that, as I've been trying to establish, that China's challenge and, and Russia's is, is, a, is a challenge to a global order. But it's also a challenge to a regional order. And when we see, or embedded in it, is a challenge to the regional order. And when we see Russia's, China's challenge to the, to the US-led regional order, we're seeing something much bigger than a challenge to something that began in the wake of the Cold War. We're seeing something which began in the mid, roughly speaking, the mid 18th century. Actually, I think the argument would be during the Seven Years War. That is the era of Anglo-Saxon maritime primacy in the Western Pacific. And, and that is absolutely central to Australia because the necessary condition for British settlement of this continent, not just settlement, but occupation, development, population, defence, what Britain did with this continent fundamentally depended on the fact that Britain was the dominant maritime power in the Western Pacific. And the survival and flourishing of that society that's, been, that's flowed from European settlement here has always depended on the maintenance of either British or after Britain faded American primacy in the Western Pacific in the two centuries and a bit, 230 years since then. And so for us, what's at stake is not just uh, the end of a comfortable era in the post-Cold War world, but something which we've regarded as necessary and sufficient for the maintenance of this society on this continent uh, for the entire history since European settlement. And so the stakes really for us are extremely high. So the next question we have to ask is, well, okay, if we're determined to push back against the Chinese and Russian challenge, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna do it? Now here I'm gonna focus on the Asian end of the story, but there's a very interesting story to be told about uh, Ukraine and Russia as well, and as I say, I'm happy to talk about that in, uh, in, in later. So there are two elements that have emerged in the way the, the, the West has thought about pushing back to China's challenge in the Western Pacific. The first is to play to our strengths by talking up our values, talking up our economic and, polit and uh, political achievements, talking up uh, our diplomatic weight, and essentially asking countries around uh, East Asia and the Western Pacific or the Indo-Pacific, who, who would you rather be dominated by? us or them? It's a pretty easy question to answer. But, um, but it's not enough. It's not enough partly because China, no, America no longer has the economic weight. America and its allies no longer have the economic weight to win the economic element of that argument. But it's also not enough because it don't, that, that kind of argument only works if people believe that not just uh, the values are on your side, but also the power and in particular, the hard edge of military power. It's, it's important to recognise that uh, when great powers compete over 
an issue as big as the issue in, in, in question here. That is, which of the world's two strongest states will be the primary power in this part of the world, in the Western Pacific. Uh, the, the, the contest takes on military connotations um, almost from the outset. That's not to say that it's necessarily going to be decided by a war. War, isn't, war between the US and China as they compete over the future leadership of East Asia is not inevitable by any means. But what is inevitable is that they will test one another's willingness to go to war as a way of measuring uh, their respective power and resolve. Um, and that's why Taiwan looms so large, because Taiwan is likely to be, not certain to be, but likely to be the issue upon which the US and China end up testing one another's power and resolve. The US will seek to prove that it remains the strongest power in East Asia by successfully deterring China from seeking to retake, as the Chinese would say, retake Taiwan, um, or defeating it if they fail to deter it. The Chinese, conversely, will seek to prove that they are now the dominant power in East Asia by showing that they can deter America from intervening if China seeks to take Taiwan, or they can defeat America if they do intervene. It's a very classic pattern of how great power contests unfold. And it is, as I say, it doesn't always lead to war. It's perfectly possible that one side or the other will win that contest because the other does back off. That China wins the contest because America decides it's not worth the candle, or that America wins the contest because, as it's done successfully since 1941, it from 1949, it deters China from seeking to retake Taiwan. Um, and that that test, that Taiwan test, as I say, it's not it's not um, the only uh, focus of their strategic competition. Uh, I think there is a real concern that we're going to see further contests over in, this, in the South China Sea over things like long-range long maritime patrol operations. But Taiwan is, is, is I think, the most, the most poignant, the most pressing, um, and it, it's helpful at least to focus on it for the purposes of the discussion. Now, the key question, if that's true, and I'm pretty sure it is, the key question is, well, who's going to win that battle of wills between the US and China? Um, the assumption is, from our side, that it's going to be us. And that assumption is based on the fact that, that the West has more power, that the United States is preponderant um, across that whole range of, of uh, varieties of national power that I mentioned before, uh, that it is the new Rome, and also that the United States and its allies have more will, that we're more determined to preserve the order than the, than the Chinese are to overturn it. And that's what I want to contest. I think both of those are wrong. Uh, it's m much, much harder to deter China from testing the United States over Taiwan than I think we understand. And it's much, much harder to win the war if we fail to deter them. And that means it is much, much harder for the United States to preserve its primacy in East Asia uh, as the foundation for the Asian order. And the reason for that is really fundamental. Um, and of course, at one level, we all know it, but I think one of the challenges we all face is that we've all been living with the rise of China for so long that we've stopped focusing on what a remarkable thing it is. Uh, the, the Australian government a few months ago published it's done, it's, several times it's published its own estimates of these of, of, of the raw economics. And the most recent of them uh, was published just a couple of months ago in a rather obscure publication by DFAT, which didn't get any publicity. But it, in, but it included treasury estimates, our treasury's estimates, of the relative size of the Chinese and the American economies in purchasing power parity terms, which is the more relevant measure for strategic purposes between the US and China today and in 2035. Today, China's economy, according to these estimates, is 19% of global GDP and America's is 16%. 19 to 16. 
But that's not the scary bit. The scary bit is in 2035, which is the day after tomorrow, they're estimating that China's economy will be 24% of global GDP and America's will be 14%. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of find that impossible to imagine. We sort of grow up with the idea that America is almost by definition the largest economy in the world. Well, it just isn't. And not by miles. It's not just that the Chinese are snuck ahead by half a metre. And these are sophisticated calculations. They're not making any sort of dumb straight line extrapolations. It takes into account the demographic challenges, for example, that China faces and the way in which the Chinese economy is changing in composition as it matures. And that really matters because uh, throughout history, strategic weight power does derive essentially from economic scale. Why was Britain the world's strongest economy and the strongest power all through the, 20th, uh, all through the 19th century? Because it had the biggest economy. Why was America the world's strongest power all through the 20th century? Because it had the biggest economy. We, sh we, should, we should not kid ourselves that those numbers don't mean that China is going to be, by a long chalk, the most powerful country in the world in the decades ahead. I think we do kid ourselves about that a bit. We somehow think that the laws of arithmetic don't apply to them as they do to us. That would be a very dangerous illusion indeed. And what that means is that we can't rely on our economic weight. We, the West, America in particular, can't rely on its economic weight or the, or the charm of its diplomacy to counteract China. It is going to come down to that military contest. And the challenge of, de of deterring China or defeating it is made all the harder by the massive resources, including technological resources, that China can bring to bear. Now, this is a big subject, and I'm going to go over it very quickly. But uh, whereas it would once have been the case that the US would have won a war with China over Taiwan easily and quickly and cheaply, and when I say once, as recently as 2000 or 2005, that would have been the case. By 2010, it was coming a bit harder to be confident. But today, actually, it's very easy to be confident. The United States cannot win a war with China over Taiwan because the Chinese have very effectively developed the air and maritime capabilities to deny the United States the capacity to project power to the waters around Taiwan, which they used to take for granted. And what that means is that a war between the US and China over Taiwan, which would, it's worth making the point, be the first great power war since 1945, first war between, or serious war between two great powers. We've had little border clashes, but no serious wars between two great powers since 1945, but it'll be the first maritime war since 1945. And it will be the first significant war between nuclear powers, two nuclear powers ever. Again, little border clashes between India and Pakistan, but we haven't seen anything nearly as serious as this would be. So it will be a very new, big, different war. And it's a war that I think we can very clearly say America cannot win as a, conven at a, as a conventional um, conflict. Now, notice I says can't win. It doesn't mean they lose it. You can't beat America that way, but you can't beat China either. They fight one another to a standstill. They do it quite quickly. I think it only takes a couple of weeks. It will be extremely costly. America would lose lots of aircraft carriers if they dared to deploy any into the theater. Uh, lose lots of aircraft, lose lots of ships. China would lose a lot of aircraft and a lot of ships and would have its bases in the mainland of China attacked. So both sides would find themselves after a couple of weeks um, bloody but unbowed and very angry. And both would ask themselves, how can we break this stalemate? And although there's quite a complex argument underpinning this, I think it's pretty clear that the two sides both conclude that nuclear weapons provides the only option. And both sides, I think, would be seriously tempted to, to, to go nuclear. One of the things that's happened in the era of uncontested US primacy is that we've forgotten about nuclear weapons. Uh, with the end of the Cold War, the nuclear confrontation eased, the Cold War nuclear confrontation. Uh, 
but the nuclear weapons didn't go away. Their numbers reduced, but the, the arsenals are still easily big enough to cause an unimaginable catastrophe. And I think there's a very real chance, and I think it's pretty clear to decision makers on both sides, there's a very real chance that because neither side can win a conventional conflict, both sides would feel impelled uh, to go nuclear relatively quickly. And that all has very big implications. The most important implication is that that means it's very hard to deter China from having a go, because it's, that is for risking a military attack on Taiwan, uh, because it's hard to persuade the Chinese that America would start a war that it can't win and would start a war that might go nuclear and by going nuclear, I mean, I mean including nuclear attacks on US cities, um, over an issue like Taiwan. Uh, and what the, one of the key reasons for that is that is the, the deep asymmetry of resolve on the two sides. This is one of the reasons why the Prussian confrontation in East Asia, and I might say in a different way, the Prussian confrontation in Eastern Europe, is different from the Cold War. What made the Cold War so stable in retrospect is that the two sides had and recognised that the other side, recognised on both sides, that the two sides had very equal resolve. The, the Soviet Union was absolutely determined not to give an inch to the Americans and the Americans were absolutely determined not to give an inch to the Soviet Union and they both knew that any attempt by either of them to disturb the status quo between them, and by the status quo, I mean in purely physical terms. For example, in the in the in the in the cold the, the Iron Curtain border between East and West, running down the middle of Europe, any attempt to violate that, even the smallest, half a dozen tanks moving one side or the other, would immediately bring them to the brink of nuclear war. Both sides knew that, so neither side did it. But that's because the, the scale of the stakes during the Cold War was so great because it was absolutely unambiguous that there was a, a zero sum um, outcome between them. Bet between two powers, there's no resolution that says you're end gonna end up with a multipolar order. With two powers in that bi bipolar order, either there was gonna be a unipolar order headed by the Soviet Union or a unipolar order headed by the United States. And that was that, that, that made the, the resolve very, very powerful. Um, I think what's, what we're seeing at the moment is a situation in which the Chinese are finding it very hard to believe that the US will really go to war over Taiwan. Now it's just worth unpacking that, partly because it's not a war that America can win anymore, whereas as I say 20 years ago they could have. Partly it's because the, the the, the, the stakes for the US are not as high as they were during the Cold War, and I just want to unpack why that's the case. During the Cold War, the United States feared, particularly the early stages of the Cold War, the United States feared that if the, that if the Soviet Union was allowed, for example, to dominate Western Europe, which it could quite easily have done if the Americans hadn't been there, that it would end up dominating the whole of Eurasia because there was very little power elsewhere in Eurasia. India was very weak. Southeast Asia was very weak. This is, you know, the 1940s, 1950s, early 1960s. China was in Russia's pocket, at least until the Sino-Soviet split, late 50s, or early 60s. And so it was a very real fear in the United States that the Soviet Union could have dominated the whole of Eurasia if they dominated uh, Western Europe. And they believed that uh, a Soviet Union, or for that matter, any country that dominated the whole of Eurasia could threaten the United States at home in the Western Hemisphere. And only a country that dominated the whole of Eurasia could threaten the United States at home in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, George um, Kennan, the architect of containment, of US containment policy, had a very sort of resonant line in which he said, um, the whole, the whole, America's entire security is bound up with, a, with preventing the emergence of Eurasian hegemon. That's really what the Cold War was all about. Now, if China threatened to replicate what the Soviet Union might have done, 
if China, having dominated East Asia and the Western Pacific, could move on to dominate the whole of Eurasia, then America would have an extraordinarily powerful reason to stop it. And just as America was prepared to bear any burden and pay any price to prevent the, America, the, the Soviets dominating uh, Western Europe during the Cold War, including fighting a nuclear war, they would be willing to do the same thing in, um, in preventing China from uh, dominating uh, uh, East Asia and the Western Pacific. But here we get back to the point I made before about these two models, a unipolar autocratic-led order or a multipolar order. Because when we unpack the distribution of power in the world today, it's very hard to see China and Russia, let alone China and Russia separately, being able to establish the kind of domination of Eurasia that would threaten the United States and drive the United States to accept the costs and risks of confronting China in East Asia. And the reason for that is there's just too much other power around. It's very different from the distribution of power in the 1940s or 1950s or even into the 1960s when India was very weak, Western Europe was very weak, uh, China was very weak. Today, you have a very strong China. But Russia is still there with many sources of power. I think we're going through a phase of underestimating Russia again. Always a mistake. Still with lots of power, including a lot of nuclear weapons. Europe today is a very funny thing, a very strange thing. We don't really, the Europeans don't understand what kind of entity it is. But it's very strategically powerful. Big population, huge economy, very deep technology nuclear weapons in the hands of a couple of, of uh, members. And, and if I can put it this way a little bit politely, some very strong military traditions. Uh, I, I, I think Europe is very formidable. Then there's India, it's extremely formidable, potentially at least. It too has nuclear weapons. It has a capacity to disappoint, but, but it, it's, it's got 1.3 billion people and an economy which is not growing as fast as China was at its heyday, but growing fast enough to become the, 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 to be the third and soon to be the second biggest economy in the world. This is a very different world from the one in which Russia, the Soviet Union, threatened to dominate Eurasia. And so w when I look at that, and then when I calculate what are the chances of Russia and China actually cooperating once they've got past the point of challenging US primacy in their own region? I mean, Russia wants to re-emerge as a great power with a sphere of influence in what the Russians call its near abroad. That's what Ukraine's all about. China wants to re-emerge as a great power with a sphere of influence in East Asia and the Western Pacific. That's what, what's happening in Asia all about. That, the fact that they both want to do that in contesting US primacy in their respective regions gives them a very strong common purpose today. But once that's done, then all... <laughs> All the evidence of history and the laws of strategic geography tell you that these two countries are destined to be rivals. In particular, they're destined to be rivals because China is much more powerful than Russia on economic and demographic grounds, but Russia is determined not to be dominated by China. And so I think that with the, by far and away the most likely outcome is that if or as China wins the contest with America in the Western Pacific, when China wins the contest with America, with America and the Western Pacific. It, it, if, if it attempts to dominate Eurasia, it will find itself running up against Russia. It will find itself running up against India, which is itself determined to be a great power in its own right in South Asia and the Indian Ocean. It will find itself confronting a very powerful Europe. And there'll still be the United States there. So, all of that leads me to conclude that by far and away the more likely of the two outcomes that I mentioned at the beginning is the kind of multipol is that multipolar model. And in that multipolar model, China doesn't threaten America at home in the Western Hemisphere. America remains as it's always been since 1824, extraordinarily powerful in its own very big backyard and very invulnerable there. And that means the United States doesn't actually have much motive to stop China dominating East Asia and the Western Pacific. The motive it does have is kind of nostalgia, sentimentality. And I can see why, you know, being a global leader is a kind of, is a kind of neat thing. 
and there are lots of people, at least people in Washington, who want to hang on to it. But once you get outside Washington, once you get out there into the real America, so to speak, well, we know. Because when Donald Trump amazed everyone by winning office as president on a platform which just repudiated the whole business of global leadership, what he, what he told us was that the American people don't buy this stuff anymore. The, the, the guys in the think tanks on Massachusetts Avenue, they buy it because that's what their living is based on. But, but out there where the voters are, out where, there where the taxes have to be collected and the votes have to be counted, they don't buy it. And the other thing it tells you that is that that's what the Democrats think too. Joe Biden ran for office uh, in 2020 on a, on, a, on a slogan of the foreign policy for the middle class. What he said was, nothing I do in foreign policy, I'll put it the other way around, everything I do in foreign policy will be directed to ask, will be shaped by asking the question, what does this matter to ordinary American families? And that's just America first with a different label. So let me go back. All of this means that it's very hard to imagine that America can effectively deter China from pushing hard on Taiwan and because the Chinese will believe the Americans won't fight back. And that makes the world very dangerous for two reasons. The first is they might be right. America might well back off and we will end up then in an Asia dominated by China. But the even scarier possibility is they might get that wrong. All of the logic I've unpacked can, can be there, but it would still be the case that at three o'clock in the morning, which is when these decisions always seem to be made, Joe Biden finds himself thinking, no, we're gonna go for it. And Joe Biden himself, in a very muddled way, has, has repeatedly said that he would defend Taiwan. So one can't rule out that possibility, even despite the very scary scenarios I painted. And that suggests that um, we face two very dangerous possibilities. One is that the US, confronted with the chest from China, steps back and abandon, in fact abandons Asia. And the second is that it doesn't, but it starts a war it can't win. And its leadership in Asia is destroyed anyway. Now what all of that tells you is that Defending that US-led global order that I started talking about at the beginning, it's not gonna work. It just, the US doesn't actually have the power or the resolve, the motive, to sustain the position that they thought they'd adopted at the end of the, at the, end of the Cold War. And, and it's really for the most basic of reasons. It's the distribution, it's the change in the distribution of wealth and power in the decades since the end of the Cold War, which has been the biggest, as I say, the biggest and fastest and most significant shift in distribution of wealth and power probably in human history. So let me just finish by saying a few things about what this means for Australia. As I said, it's going to be different. Um, this is a profound change and a profound shock. We have always sensed, I think, the Europeans and others from other parts of the world who've settled on this continent have always sensed that whilst we relied on Anglo-Saxon power, British and Britain and America, our great and powerful friends in Menzies' famous phrase, while we've relied on them to keep Asia and make Asia safe for us, for a long time, right back into the 19th century, there was always a sense that that wouldn't last forever, that eventually Asia's power potential would be realised and we'd find ourselves in an Asia dominated by Asians. Um, but that sense, and, and a lot of Australian history, a lot of history, history of Australian foreign policy, particularly after the Second World War, was framed around that kind of recognition. Not that we expected it to happen this, you know, this decade or even next decade, but it was out there somewhere and we needed to prefer, prepare for it. But that sense, I think, collapsed in the mid 1990s. And it collapsed partly because of John Howard, I think, because I think Howard didn't buy that, and it's a whole story there. But I think it collapsed more fundamentally because of the emergence of the model of the unipolar US-led order. 
we started to believe, and not just John Howard, but we Australians started to believe that American power would last forever. And we've been taken by surprise to wake up 20 years later and discover that's not true. And I think we're very ill prepared for this. One of the ways we're ill prepared is that we still carry with us a sense of American invulnerability. We therefore still seem to have a very deep confidence that America can defeat China despite all the points I've made. And in particular, at least some of us, uh, believe that China is going to be easy to deter and that if we just talk tough, I'm talking about you, Peter Dutton, if we just talk tough, the Chinese will back off. You'd have to talk a lot tougher than Peter Dutton to scare off the guys in Zhongnanhai. They are very hard people indeed. And what's more, there's a belief that if the deterrence doesn't work, then we, Australia, should support the United States in a war with China designed to preserve the US-led order in this region and globally. And I think that's wrong because it's not a war we'd win. And that's a, that's a very important point. When, when Australian political leaders have been talking about this going back to the 1930s, when they invoked the, the lessons of, of Munich as they have, they're telling us that they believe we should go to war with China to, to preserve the old US-led order. And we've slid into this belief. I think that belief is pretty widely accepted. We've slid into this belief without seriously examining it, without seriously examining what that war would mean uh, and what the alternatives are. Now, if I'm right, well, maybe put it the other way. If I'm wrong, if the alternative is a Chinese or Chinese and Russian-led global autocratic order which imposed China's political values on Australia, then you might make an argument, though it, would be, it wouldn't be an easy one, you might make an argument that the horrendous kind of war I'm talking about would be worth fighting. But I think you really can't make that argument if you think that the, what would follow would not be a Chinese-led autocratic global order, but a multipolar order. Because in a multipolar order like that, there's lots of space for countries like us to make our own way. And just to focus specifically on our predicament in this part of the world, it's not that this environment would not be harder for us than living under US primacy. It would be harder. Living under US primacy has been a dream for Australia. It's one of the reasons we don't take foreign policy seriously enough. Why would we need to? The world has worked so well for us. But it'd be, it would be harder for us, but it's, a, it's not impossible. The first point to note is that we're not going to live in an Asia dominated by China. We're going to live in an Asia which is dominated by China on one side and India on the other. And that gives us a golden opportunity to sit between them and play them off against one another. And this is what smaller and middle powers do in these multipolar systems. They play the great powers off against one another. And we are very well placed to do that because we sit right on the dividing line between their two spheres of influence. The second point is that I don't think we need to fear that either China or India, as they exercise their prerogatives as great powers, are necessarily going to be territorially aggressive or are necessarily going to be terribly interested and intrusive in our domestic political affairs. There's a bit of history behind this. Some great powers have been very intrusive. Think Joseph Stalin in, uh, in Eastern Europe in the 1940s and 50s, for example. But other great powers haven't been. For example, America in the Western Hemisphere. And I, think, I don't think we, there is any evidence to sustain the proposition that either China or India are going to be especially politically intrusive into Australia. Um, or for that matter, other countries. So I don't think we need to fear a silent invasion, or rather to put it another way, I don't think it's gonna be that hard for us to defend our, I'm gonna use a broad phrase here, our way of life, our way of organizing our society, even in, a, even in an Asia which is dominated by China and India. And the third point is we've got a lot of people to work with because one of the things that's gonna happen in this Asia is there are lots of other small and middle powers with an interest very like ours. They're going to be living between India and China. They're going to be trying to maximise their freedom to manoeuvre. There's going to be plenty of opportunity to cooperate with them. And some of them are going to be quite big and significant, powerful players, like Indonesia, 
which will be the fourth biggest economy in the world well before the middle of the century. There's a lot we can do to manage that. So I think we could learn to live with China's power and it would be a lot better to do that than to keep pursuing the sleep walk to war. But our current politics and our current policies point in the other direction. Our two political parties have a very dense, complete bipartisanship on this and that's become more clear since the election rather than less. They have very deep faith in America's capacity to solve our China problem for us by deterring or defeating China militarily. And I think that's a very risky strategy for us to take. Uh, I therefore think we need to stop and rethink very deeply. And that's gonna be hard for us to do both because of our own predilections and presumptions and also because of an international environment, for example, in NATO, which is very much inclined to see this whole issue more darkly than I do. And as I say, that's partly because of what's happened in Ukraine. Uh, but they're getting it wrong. NATO gets things wrong all the time. They went for NATO expansion after all, which was a major mistake. They're expanding to include Finland and Sweden, which I think is an even bigger mistake. And they were the guys who thought that trying to reconstruct Afghanistan was a great idea. Don't put great faith in NATO. What we need to do is to look into our own situation and that's gonna require better quality political leadership on this issue than we've seen for a long time. But we are living through the biggest shift in our international setting, Australia's international setting, since European settlement. It's gonna profoundly change the way we live in Asia. Uh, and if we get it wrong, it will be devastating for our future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugh. That's been a, an extraordinary tour de force of, of talking. It's, it fills in some of this. I'm going to quote from that, Hugh. Just, and, and Judith, forgive me if I take some of your qu first question. Um, you say, instead of helping America to manage the strat strategic transition in Asia, wisely we're encouraging Washington to confront Beijing in a test it cannot win. <clears throat> well, you've made that very clear. We've now just had um, Anthony Albanese uh, supporting and, and saying on the, on the sidelines of NATO that China is a danger. We've had Richard Miles talking about Taiwan. We've had Penny Wong pushing Australia's role in the Pacific. What should they be doing differently? Now, will that, will that microphone work? You can use that microphone. Yes, yeah. What should they be doing differently? Well, that's a very big yes. subject. Four steps. The absolute first essential is that, is that our government, our political leaders, start explaining to Australia the actual situation we face. The foundation of Australian policy on both sides of the politics at the moment is that America is powerful enough to defeat China's challenge to the US-led order in Asia. And until, but, but they must know that's not true. I mean, they published those figures. 24% to 14%. I mean, it's near as damn it to twice the size. It just defies the laws of strategic gravity that the United States could prevail over China in an issue in which America's own most vital interests are not engaged in China's own backyard when China is inherently a much more powerful country. And until we start having a conversation about that, the fundamental shift in the distribution of wealth and power which drives everything else, then we're not gonna get anywhere. So that's the first thing we have to do. The second thing we have to do is to start talking to America very differently. Because at the moment, we are encouraging America to think that we will support them in trying to deter, and if we don't deter, then trying to defeat China militarily. And I think we underestimate how much that increases our dangers. We tend to look at the US political and strategic system as a huge edifice, which is completely impenetrable. And it's not. Actually, as is usually the case in these things, the number of people who actually make decisions in Washington, D.C. on these issues, there's probably about 100 of them, something like that. And Australia, believe it or not, actually looms quite large for them. Partly because we're so 
bloody noisy on this issue. And, you know, we think that's great because they all nod and agree and slap us on the back and call us mates because we absolutely support what, they, what they're talking about. But what, by doing that, we're encouraging them to think that they're on the right track in trying to confront China. And, that, and we, we make it our, our enthusiasm, Peter Dutton's enthusiasm, for going to war with China will make it more likely that at three o'clock in the morning an American president will do that. And I think that is potentially very disastrous for us. So we have to go to America and say something very bold. Because if I'm right, my argument would be that we should be absolutely crystal clear that whatever else we do, we're not going to go to war with China to try and preserve US primacy. And we should tell America that. Because uh, it's a war they can't win. And you know, we're, we uh, Anglo-Saxons, so to speak, have a happy experience, relatively happy experience, of war for the last hundred and something years. We've been on the winning side. We wouldn't be on the winning side of this one. The third thing we need to do is to go and talk to the Chinese and talk to them a bit differently, not by saying, oh, OK, you know, you can have what you like. That's the last thing you want to say. But you do want to go and talk to, start talking to them on the basis that we accept that and recognise that as, a, as the world's most powerful state. They are going to be much more influential in Asia than they have been in the past. And to start talking them through that. And the last thing we need to do is to talk very differently to our neighbours. Because the way both sides of politics have made a big thing about regional diplomacy. But, you know, talking to India, talking to Japan, talking to the Southeast Asians. But the way in which we've done that, the way we've framed that, is that we go to them and persuade them that they should agree with us about how to deal with China. In other words, our diplomacy in the region is to go and read America's talking points to our neighbours. And the fact is, they don't believe it. I mean, they just don't buy it. And so that undermines our credibility. What we should do is do something a little bit different, and that is go to the region and start listening. Because these guys actually are handling... When I say these guys, the Indonesians, the Singaporeans, the New Zealanders, interestingly, although it would be interesting to see what... Jacinda Ardern yes. says down there at the Lowy Institute tomorrow, I think it is. Um, but there are plenty of countries in our, in our neighbourhood who are dealing with all the issues that we're dealing with, have all the anxieties that we have, and sometimes more anxieties because they live closer to China, and yet they don't seem to be digging themselves in the same hole that we're digging ourselves into. So I, I, I think we have a lot to learn from them. Right, now I'm going to open for questions. Peter Boehm, one, two, three. Peter, Peter Boehm, one, two, three, four. Um, you held up the quarterly essay a few minutes ago. It's the most significant, important, powerful quarterly essay I've read in years. Oh, thank you. And uh, I'd encourage please, everyone please. to read it. Uh, please, please tell Black Ink that. <laughs> You, you talk about a multipolar yes. world and you say we need a strong Russia mm. as part of that yes, multipolar no, world. How do we get a strong Russia? Well, I, Peter, Peter, I'm not sure that's the problem. I think, I think we've, we've got a strong Russia. We just need to work out how to live with it. And that's not easy. This is, this is going to be a bit awkward. Because, as I say, Russia, I think the way in which Russia has sought to establish its sphere of influence over Ukraine is, is li literally inexcusable, both because it's invaded, which it didn't need to do, and because it's invaded in such a brutal manner. I mean, I, I just... There's a lot we don't understand about what's happened in Ukraine since February. But the extent to which the Russians seem to have deliberately targeted civilians, to me, makes no military sense at all. It's the point of engineering. I mean, why waste the resources blowing up people's apartment blocks? They're not going to fight back at you. So there's something very odd about that. But the proposition that Russia is going to have and we can't stop them having a sphere of influence in the near abroad, I think that's something we, must, we have to learn to live with. So let me give you a really scary analogy. The last time the world tried to build a multipolar order was in 1945, when at the end of the Second World War, 
nobody thought there was going to be a unipolar, or for that matter, even a bipolar order. What they thought was going to happen was that there was going to be a multipolar order with five great powers, there's still the P5 in the Security Council, uh, and their relationships with, what, they were clearly going to be at the top table, they were clearly going to be the ones who decided how the world was run, the rest of us, smaller and middle powers, just had to sort of fit in around the edges. Luckily, thanks to Doc Evatt, amongst others, there was an institutional structure to do that in the UN. But it was clear that, the great, that those five great powers were going to be the ones that really counted. And in order to make that work, Roosevelt in particular had to make some real concessions to Moscow. That's what happened at Yalta in January of 1945. And the heart of the deal was, OK, you can have Eastern Europe as long as you're prepared to accept this multipolar structure. And Stalin said yes. And two ways of reading that. One is that it did actually work in the sense that it established that those two very rigid spheres of influence, which the Cold War never, never violated. Um, now, it was a terrible outcome for the Poles, say. Um, and if you go to Poland and talk about Yalta, you'll get a lot of very strong views expressed. And I understand that. But if you actually look at the choice that, that Roosevelt faced um, with the Red Army on the outskirts of Berlin and by far and away the most powerful army the world had ever seen, uh, Roosevelt had to ask himself, well, am I going to go to war, have another war? Once we've defeated the Nazis, have another war with the Red Army? And we know how good the Red Army is. The Red Army would have beaten the rest of us cold because the, I mean, they beat the Germans. The Germans were really good, very good army. And uh, we, we, could, we were no match for them. So would they fight a war to defend Poland, which they wouldn't win, and which would have devastated Poland? Would the Poles have been better off? No. So it's the same kind of choice today, actually. I mean, I think the problem we have in Ukraine is that Russia has behaved repugnantly, but the idea that we can push Russia out of Ukraine and humiliate it and push it back and turn it into a middle-sized power, it's not going to happen. So we're going to have to learn to live with a powerful Russia. And that's going to require us to make some compromises we really badly don't want to make, just as learning to live with a powerful China is going to require us to make some compromises in Asia that we really don't want to make, including compromises about the future or concessions. I think compromises is a too glamorous a word for it. About the future of Taiwan. And, you know, if that feels icky and horrible and morally compromised, well, welcome to power politics. <laughs> because remember, what's on the other side is nuclear war. And, you know, pieces of value too. Mm. Sorry, Stephen. long answer, but a good question. Uh, Stephen Burns, comment on Russia. Um, Russia's economy is just slightly bigger than Australia's. Yeah. Um, and I heard this uh, Ukrainian development was essentially the last imper European imperialist war. So Russia is trying to expand its, its territory. So uh, just a commentary, I don't believe Russia will be, any, will be still a great power mm. because economically, mm. economically, mm. its uh, economy won't suffer, it's nothing like China, mm. uh, which is trillion, multi-trillion dollars. Um, but my two questions are, one, um, we talk about China as being an impenetrable bulwark, you know, the yeah. Chinese Communist Party, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, how long do you think the current president will be in power? Mm. Because I tell you what, he's made lots and lots of enemies internally in China. Mm. And I think one of his first major mistakes is the fact that he's made zero COVID as the policy which shows he's not omnipotent and all-seeing. It starts to raise questions in the Chinese population and also in the Chinese Communist Party. The second question is, would the attempt to invade Taiwan, even with minimal uh, US support, be far too expensive for, for China? Um, it's a big strait of water, and Taiwan has armed the teeth with missiles and all sorts of... Uh, uh, munitions and will just make it too expensive for China to, to, to invade Taiwan. 
Okay. We've um, got two more questions, so keep I, I, can, Right. I'll be as quick as I can. Look, you're absolutely right about Russia economically, and I'm conscious that what I'm going to say is going to contradict what I said before about economics being the foundation of national power. But there's something odd about Russia. And, and part of it is its sheer geography. One of the things that Russia has going for it is that it's so big that it's a local power in four completely different parts of the world at once. And that does seem to make a big difference. The second is that, it, and of course, there's an awful lot of things that Russia can't do because it doesn't have a big economy. But it does have 1,500 active service nuclear weapons and probably another six or 7,000 back in the warehouse. And if you'll forgive this technical strategic term, when the shit hits the fan, that really counts for something. So Russia is a very strong defensive power. It has got, it's got a great capacity to resist other countries intruding onto it. But it also does, well, um, Russia at the time of Napoleon, for example, and this is lots of disanalogies, but Russia at the time of Napoleon was, 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 was economically relatively weak. All it had was uh, a very big population. But it's worth remembering that it wasn't just that Napoleon retreated from Moscow in 1812, it's that the Russians advanced. And by 1814, they occupied Paris. Uh, there's, it's, there's, yeah, there's, as I said, there's something creepy about Russia. Uh, I, I think you, you've got to be very careful of it. And I do think it's strong enough to resist Chinese hegemony, whatever its other weaknesses are. So, um, your, your, the Jinping. second question was about... China, Xi Jinping. Oh, Xi Jinping. How, will, will he last? Yeah, will he really last? And, and, Look, can, and I, can he um, really go into Taiwan? Yeah. I, I don't... I'm, I don't speak Chinese. I'm not, a, I'm not a sort of a sinologist. A lot of my colleagues at ANU really are, and I spend quite a lot of my time sitting at their feet asking dumb questions and trying to understand the answers. So I don't, I don't you know, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not going to do more than reflect other people's views on Xi Jinping's predicament. Um, of course, it's always possible in a highly autocratic structured system like that. Um, that there's a that he gets thrown out. Um, I, I wouldn't disagree with that for a moment. Um, but uh, the the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is a remarkable institution, and the the, the instruments of control that Xi seems to be in charge of uh, look very robust. So I wouldn't put it this way. I wouldn't bet anything on the proposition that he goes quickly. Um, but I also don't believe him going makes that much difference. Xi's personality obviously has done something, and his, his manner, his political persona, has done something to affect the tone of things over the last decade. But whoever was leading China at the point at which China's economy overtook America as the way it has, would be seeking to do exactly what Xi Jinping's trying to do. And so I, I can easily, I find it very hard to imagine that an alternative would necessarily be much, necessarily much easier for us to deal with. The point about the COVID, zero COVID is a very interesting one because most of the time I've developed a working hypothesis that most of the time the Chinese Communist Party in their own lights gets things right. They prove to be remarkably effective at managing to deliver what they want. And I look at the zero COVID policy, I think that just looks dumb. So maybe they're just screwing it up, but whether that undermines the whole credibility of the party and endangers Xi Jinping's position, I, I, I'm just not sure. It, it could be, but I, I think in the end, I, that's not gonna be a game changer. Look, on Taiwan, I just say, um, uh, there's two points. The first is the, Ch the Chinese don't have to invade Taiwan in order to subjugate it. They can blockade it. Blockade actually is most of the time, particularly against continental powers, a pretty useless strategy. But against a very trade dependent, dependent island economy situated, you know, a stone's throw from the Chinese coast. If you wanted to set up an abstract model for the perfect blockade scenario, Taiwan is it. And the second point is that Taiwanese are not armed to the teeth. 
consider their strategic situation, they spend the same proportion of GDP on defence as we do. They spend 2%. Now, if they spent 5% the way the Singaporeans do, then I'd start to take them seriously. I, I, I don't actually think the Taiwanese are very serious about their own defence. And I don't think it's very hard for the Chinese to overcome the defences that, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the Taiwanese have. It wouldn't be easy in the sense that there'd be lots of casualties, but I don't see anyone in Beijing worrying much about that. I think they could do it. The, the, the slightly stronger question is how hard would it be for them to, to suppress opposition in Taiwan once they had controlled the territory? Controlling the territory is one thing, controlling the population is, is another. Um, and all I can say is that the Chinese seem very confident that they can do it. And if anybody can do it, they can, <laughs> because they are very experienced at political oppression. Um, and so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't myself, I think it would be very ugly. I think it would be a tragedy. I, you know, I'm, I'm very, I have a lot of admiration for Taiwan, for what Taiwan's achieved, particularly since the mid-90s. I mean, economically and technologically, but also politically and culturally. But I just don't think, I, I wouldn't want to bet that they could stand up in front of Beijing. Look, look, I'm, look, I'm going to have to okay. check with my vice president. What time do we have to, have to be out? Like okay. Look, the next question is you. here, a bit, bit further forward. Yes, it was that one, I think, yes. Yeah, uh, perhaps... perhaps um... Um, thank you for your talk. I was concerned about the frame of reference. <clears throat> it seemed to be one of conflict. <clears throat> uh, I mean, one could ask what happened to the United Nations. The other point is that the context really seemed to be uh, 800 years ago in Italy, the time of Machiavelli and the Prince. Now, you remember in the film The Third Man, where Harry Lyme, in that amazing scene in the elevator, was asked about that and the matter of peace. And he just said, you'll remember, that... Uh, we had wars and conflict and, and assassinations, heaven knows what, in Italy, what did we get? The Renaissance. Yes. And in Switzerland, we had peace. What did we get? The cuckoo, cuckoo clock. clock. <laughs> That's right. Now, I mean, I don't understand if we can afford this contestation and all the rest of it. Think of the difficulties and challenges we really face. We've seen some of them in the last few months. Climate change, water, energy, pandemics, even getting on with one another. I mean, are we really going to carry on the same way as we did 800 years ago? Is that as how far we've come? I, I, OK, thank you. Do you want to take that one on? Uh, you, well, the, the, there's two points to make. The first is you're absolutely right. One of the many reasons why it's so important to avoid a conflict over the future order in Asia and globally is precisely that that gets so badly in the way of dealing with all sorts of other problems, including climate change. And so I do think, I think there are other reasons, like nuclear war, but you know, the fact that so many other things to be dealt with um, just amplifies the point. But I think you know, the reality is that states still behave very much the way states always did because people still behave very much the way people always did. And it might be surprising and disappointing to discover that we haven't learned much, but what, stri you know, what strikes me is that, we are, that our political leaders are sailing into, and not just in Australia, are sailing into a confrontation which has a very high risk of conflict with all the same ideas, and indeed with less historical consciousness, than we sailed into the First World War and the Second World War. And so I join you in deploring it, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And given that that's a looming risk, it's something we need to manage, rather than just pretending that it's something we should consign to history. I, I, look, I have just had a, a nod from the Vice President, so I'm, I'm, even though there are questions here, please do speak to, to Hugh afterwards. But I, I will need to thank you now. And, okay. and as, as Judith said, it, I'm afraid it's nearly half a century ago we were it in, is indeed. in, in, I in can't, Oxford together. I can't imagine how that could be true, but no, no. Um, seems as, to as be. As young philosophers, what you've brought, I think, is 
the analytic skills and the clarity of language from the philosophical background to all of that half a century working on strategic <laughs> defence issues. And I think that's been really illuminating, but I think also what's so important to me is the sort of good temperedness, the even temperedness. This is not an area, as you say, where emotions go. Yeah. Uh, don't, don't come up easily. I, I think that the lesson that you're telling us that we can't any longer rely on the US as a global power is, 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 a, is, is an important one and that we need to be thinking seriously about whether the US would come and bail us out as the Brits failed to in mm. Singapore. That said, giving up being a global power is really hard. Yes. And I think we see that looking at what's happening in Russia and Ukraine yes, right yes, now. Yes. We're certainly, well, no, to my mind, we've seen it, and I think you agree, in, in, in some of the kerfuffles in England, in the United Kingdom, yes. coming to terms yeah. with not being a global yes, power. Yes, absolutely. And I wonder whether, to some extent, what we're seeing with China is ressentiment for the loss of their global power two centuries ago. And it's going to be very hard I'll, for us all to go through this, and I think it's pretty hard for us as yeah, well, yeah. because we'll have to negotiate. And I suppose what I want to say is, if there's anything that philosophers should be committed to, it's reasoned and calm debate, and our own, um, as you can see it, our own uh, omnia query. <laughs> I mean, don't, yes. don't criticise yes. my Latin. Yes. Uh, um, we have to keep questioning. Question. Yeah. We keep, yeah. have to keep yeah. having yeah. these debates, yeah. and we have to do yeah. it in a good-tempered, reasoned and evidence-based fashion. So I want to thank you very much, and now I'll hand over to Judith to close the meeting. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you very much.